All right. Um, so another shave. Um, this one, you know, we can kind of think of when we were talking on the first slide about the targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma, how that one was different because it didn't have these um, long areas in the epidermis kind of surrounding the vessels, which is what we see here. Um, so whenever I see these, I think of like um, sebi hemangiomas. So uh, I think uh, angiokeratoma is good for this one. Yeah, very nice. This is a <clears throat> beautiful angiokeratoma. And like you said, the channels themselves look quite similar to those dilated cavernous channels that we see at the top of the targetoid hemosiderotic mangioma. The main difference here is that we're actually getting the channels get, get trapped up and wrapped by the reedy of the epidermis. The epidermis reaches down and wraps around each channel, which makes it look like this case doesn't show, you know, perfect, complete wrapping of each vessel, but it doesn't have to be perfect wrapping. Um, of the vessel, but you get like what looks like a vessel floating in the middle of the epidermis. It's kind of an illusion because look, you can still see there's a little layer of collagen right here between the endothelial cell and the epidermal keratinocytes because vessels can't just like exist totally naked in the epidermis, right? I mean, they have to have a connection to the dermis and they're going to be surrounded by basement membranes. So, so in any case, um, that's what you've got. These vessels that are floating, it looks like they're floating in the epidermis because the epidermis is wrapping around them. Oftentimes you get thrombus in here, and look, this thrombus is starting to organize and make some papillary endothelial hyperplasia, a sawn tumor type of effect. There was a little more of it up uh, up in this top piece, actually. Yeah, look, blood and fibrin, and it's starting to get recanalized and starting to begin to make some little tiny tufts of papillae. Oh yeah, there you can see it even better over here. So see, this process is, is always happening. You just It's just not as florid as that last case. So learning to see it um, when it's doing this at a subtle level, you can begin to get really comfortable recognizing it. Uh, but this is nice, you know, bright reddish pink fibrin, and it's wrapping into little tiny papillae here. So here I would call this a angiokeratoma with focal organizing thrombus. These also oftentimes break open on the skin and bleed to the surface. They often, I feel, get traumatized and have hemorrhage and ulceration on top. Totally normal. Uh, the biggest difference also uh, between this and targeted hemosiderotic is one, that the vessels get actually entrapped in the epidermis, and two, in targeted hemosiderotic, you'll also, if you have a deep enough shave, see those little thin slit-like channels that are compressed and trickling between the collagen down below, whereas in true angiokeratoma, you just see these big cavernous spaces up top without those down below. Doesn't really matter. Either way, we're dealing with a benign uh, lesion, right? I mean, I guess the one time it might matter is in patients with uh, what syndrome? Do patients get multiple angiokeratomas? Fabry? Yeah, Fabry's disease. Good. Uh, but, you know, most of the time when I see these, these are solitary incidental lesions and they're biopsying them just to make either because they're annoying the patient and bleeding or because they want to make sure it's not a melanoma because they often look really dark colored, violaceous to black because of all the blood and the, the thrombus that begins to form in them sometimes. So angiokeratoma. Oh, and again, if you have something that looks like this and it's a radiated site, then the answer probably is actually atypical vascular lesion, post-radiation atypical vascular lesion. So the, the context really matters. So if I see anything that has channels like this and it's on the breast of an adult, I want to check and find out that they have a history of radiation because a lot of times you're not told that information. Um, sometimes in, the dermatologist may not even know for sure. So if I have access to the chart, I usually will go and look just to make sure there's not a radiation history.